readers, welcome back to Reads with Reem B. And we have Ash back with us. Hello. So we are going to carry on with our read, A Little Princess. And we are in Chapter 8, In the Attic. The first night she spent in, the, in her attic was a thing Sarah never forgot. During its passing, she lived through a wild, unchildlike woe of which she never spoke to anyone about her. There was no one who would, un who would have understood. It was, indeed, well for her that as she lay awake in the darkness of her mind was forcibly distracted now and then by the strangeness of her surroundings. It was, perhaps, well for her that she was reminded by her small body of material things. If this had not been so, the anguish of her young mind might have been too great for a child to bear. But really, while the night was passing, she scarcely knew that she had a body at all or remembered any of the other any other thing than one my papa is dead she whispered to herself my papa is dead it was not long afterwards that she realized that her bed had been so hard and that she had turned over and over in it to find a place to rest that darkness had seemed more intense than any other she had ever known that than any other she had ever known and that the wind howled over the roof and among the chimneys like something which wailed aloud and then there was something worse. This was the certain scufflings and scratchings and squeakings in the walls and behind the skirting boards, and she knew what they meant, because Becky had described them. They meant rats and mice who were either fighting or playing with each other. Once or twice she even heard sharp-toed feet scurrying across the floor, and she remembered in those days, at, in, in those after days, when she recalled things, that when she had first heard them, she had started up in bed and sat trembling, and when she lay down again, she covered her head with, bed, with the bedclothes. The change in her life did not come about gradually, but was made all at once. She must begin as she is to go on, said Miss Minchin to Miss Amelia. She must be taught at once what she is to expect. Mariette had left the house the next morning. The glimpse Sarah had caught of her sitting room as she passed its open door showed her that everything had changed. Had been changed. Her, ornament, her ornaments and luxuries had been removed, and the bed had been placed in the corner to transform it, form it for in, to transform it into a new pupil's bedroom. When she went down for breakfast, she saw her seat at Miss Minchin's side was occupied by Lavinia, and Miss Minchin spoke to her co coldly. You will begin your new duties, Sarah. By taking, she said. By taking your seat with the younger children at a smaller table. You must keep them quiet and see that they behave well and do not waste their food. You ought to have been down earlier. Lottie has already upset her tea. This was the beginning. From day to day, her duties were, the duties given to her were added to. She taught the younger children French and heard their other lessons. These were the least of her labors. It was found that she could be made use of in numberless directions. She could be sent on errands at any time and, and in all weathers. She could be told to do things other people neglected. The cook and the housemaids took their tone from Miss Minchin and rather enjoyed or ordering about the young one who had been made so who had been made so much fuss of for so long. The so the servants were not the be of the best class, and they had neither good manners nor good tempers, and it was frequently convenient to have someone at hand on whom blame could be laid. <clears throat> During the first month or two, Sarah thought her willingness to do things as well as she could, and her silence under reproof might soften those who drove her so hard. In her proud little heart, she wanted them to see that she was trying to earn her living and not accepting charity. But the time came when she saw that no one was softening at all, and the more she was willing to do, as she was told, the more domineering and exacting careless housemaids became, and the more ready a scolding cook was to blame her. If she had been older, Miss Minchin would have given her th to the bigger girls to teach, and saved money by dismissing an instructress. But while she remained and looked like a child, she could be made to more useful as a sort of little superior errand girl and maid of all work. An ordinary errand boy would not have been so clever and reliable. Sarah could be trusted with difficult commissions and complicated messages. She could even go and pay bills, 
and she combined this with the ability to dust a room well and set things in order. Her own lessons became a thing of the past. She was taught nothing, and only after long, busy days spent running here and there at everybody's orders was she grudgingly allowed into the deserted schoolroom with a pile of old books and study alone at night. If I had not reminded myself of the things I had learned, perhaps I may have forgot them, she said to herself. I'm almost a scullery maid, and if I'm a scullery maid, who knows, nothing, I shall be poor like Becky. I wonder if I could quite forget and begin to drop my H's and not remember that Henry the Eighth had six wives. One of the most curious things in her new existence was her changed position among the peoples. Instead of being sort of a small royal personage among them, she no longer seemed to be one of them, uh, one of their number at all. She was kept so constantly at work that she scarcely had an opportunity of speaking to any of them. And she could not avoid seeing that Miss Minchin preferred that she should live a life apart from that of the occupants of the schoolroom. I will not have her forming intimacies and talking to the other children, that lady said. Girls like a grievance, and if she begins to tell romantic stories about herself, she will become an ill-used heroine, and parents will be given a wrong impression. It is better that she should live a separate life, one suited to her circumstances. I am giving her a home, and that is more than she has any right to expect from me. Sarah did not expect much, and was far too proud to try and continue to be intimate with the girls, who evidently felt rather awkward and uncertain about her. The fact was that Miss Minchin's people were a, dull, were a set of dull, matter-of-fact young people. They were accustomed to being rich and comfortable, and as Sarah's frocks grew shorter and shabbier and queer-looking, it became an established fact that she wore shoes with holes in them, and was sent out to buy groceries and carry them through the streets in a basket on her arm and when the cook wanted when the cook wanted them in a hurry and they felt rather as if when they spoke to her they were addressing an underservant to think that she was a girl with the diamond mines lavinia commented she does look an object and she's queerer than ever i've never liked her much but i can't bear that way she has now of looking at people without speaking just as if she's finding them out I am, said Sarah promptly when she heard this. That's what I look at people for. I like to know about them. I think I think them over afterwards. The truth was that she had saved herself annoyance several times by keeping her eye on Lavinia, who was quite ready to make mischief, and would have been rather pleased to have had it for the ex show pupil. And would have been quite rather pleased to have made it for the ex show pupil. Sarah never made any mischief herself or interfered with anyone. She worked like a drudge. She tramped through the wet streets, carrying parcels and baskets. She laboured with the childish intention of the little ones, French lessons, and she became shabbier and more forlorn looking. She was told that she had better take her meals downstairs. She was treated as if she was nobody's concern, and her heart grew proud and sore, but she never told anyone what she felt. Soldiers don't complain, she would say between her small, shut teeth. I am not going to do it either. I will pretend this is part of a war. But there were hours when her child heart almost have broke with loneliness, but for three people. The first, it must be owned, was Becky. Just Becky. Throughout all that first night spent in the garret, she had felt a vague comfort in knowing that on the other side of the wall, in which the rats scuffled and squeaked, there was another young human creature. And during the nights that followed, the sense of comfort grew. They had little chance to speak to each other during the day. Each had her own task to perform, and any attempt at conversation would have been regarded as a tendency to loiter and lose time. Don't mind me, miss, Becky whispered during the first morning. If I don't say nothing polite, and um, be down on us if I did, I mean, please and thank you and begging your pardon, but I didn't s take time to say it. But before daybreak, she used to slip into Sarah's attic and button her dress and give her such help as she required before she went downstairs to light the kitchen fire. And when night came, Sarah always heard the humble knock at the door, which meant that her handmaid was ready to help her again if she was needed. During the first weeks of her grief, Sarah felt as if she was too stupefied to talk. So it happened that some time passed before they saw each other much or exchanged visits. Becky's heart told her that it was 
best that people in trouble should be left alone. The second of the trio of comforters was Ermengarde, but odd things happened before Ermengarde found her place. When Sarah's mind seemed to awaken again to the life about her, she realised that she had forgotten that an Ermengarde lived in the world. The two had always been friends, but Sarah had felt as if she was years the older. It could not be contested that Ermengarde was as dull as she was affectionate. She clung to Sarah in simple, helpless ways. She brought her lessons to her that she might be helped. She listened to her every word and besieged her with requests for stories. But she had nothing interesting to say herself, and she loathed books to every of every description. She was, in fact, not a person one would remember when one was caught in the storm of a great trouble and Sarah forgot, forgot her. It had all been easier to forget her because she had been suddenly called home for a few weeks. When she came back, she did not see Sarah for a day or two, and when she met her for the first time, she encountered her coming down a corridor with her arms full of garments which to be taken downstairs to be mended. Sarah herself had already been taught to mend them. She looked pale and unlike herself, and she was attired in a queer, overgrown frock whose shortness showed so much thin black leg. Ermengarde was too slow a girl to be equal to such a situation. She could not think of anything to say. She, she knew what had happened, but somehow she could never imagine Sarah would look like this, so odd and poor and almost like a servant. It made her quite miserable, and she could do nothing but break into a short, hysterical laugh and exclaim aimlessly as this, if without any meaning, Oh, Sarah, is that you? Yes, answered Sarah, and suddenly a strange thought passed through her mind and made her face flush. She held the pile of garments in her arms, her chin rested on top to keep it steady. Something in the look of her straight-gazing eyes made Ermengarde lose her wits still more. She felt as if Sarah had changed into a new kind of girl, and she had never known her before. Perhaps it was because she was suddenly grown poor and had things to mend and work like Becky. Oh, she stammered. How are you? I don't know, Sarah replied. How are you? I am quite well said Ermengarde, overwhelmed with shyness, and then spasmodically she thought of something to say which seemed more intimate. Uh, are you unhappy? She said in a rush. Then Sarah was guilty of an injustice. Just at that moment her torn heart swelled within her, and she felt as if anyone was as stupid as that. They had better get away from her. What do you think? She said. Do you think I'm very happy? And she marched past her without another word. Of course, at the time, she realised that if her wretchedness had not made her forget things, she would have known that poor, dull Ermengarde was not to be blamed for her unready, awkward ways. She was always awkward, and the more she felt, the more stupid she was given to being. But, sudden thought had, but the sudden thought had flashed upon her and made her oversensitive. She is like the others, she thought. She does not really want to talk to me. She knows no one does. So for several weeks, a barrier stood between them, and when they met by chance, Sarah looked the other way, and Armengard felt too stiff and embarrassed to speak. Sometimes they nodded at each other in exchange, but there were other times where they did not even exchange a greeting. If she would rather not talk to me, Sarah thought, I will keep out of her way. Miss Minchin makes that easy enough. Miss Minchin made it so easy at, that at last they scarcely saw each other at all. At the time, it was noticed that Ermengarde was getting stupider than ever, and she looked listless and unhappy. She used to sit in the window seat, huddled in a heap, and stare out of the window without speaking. Once, Jessie, who was passing, stopped to look at her curiously. What are you crying for, Ermengarde? She asked. I'm not crying, answered Ermengarde in a muffled, unsteady voice. You are! said Jessie. A great big tear just rolled down the bridge of your nose and dropped off the end of it. And there goes another. Well, said Ermengarde, I'm miserable and no one need interfere. And she turned her plump back and took her, her, took out her handkerchief and boldly hid her face in it. That night, when Sarah went to the attic, she was later than usual. She had been kept at work until after the hour of which the pupils went to bed. And after that, she had gone to her lessons in the learning schoolroom. When she reached the top of the stairs, she was surprised to see a glimmer of light coming from under the attic door. 
Nobody get nobody goes there but myself. She thought quickly. But someone has lighted a candle. Someone had indeed lighted the candle, and it was not burning in the kitchen candlesticks she was expected to use, but in one of those belonging to the pupils' bedrooms. There was someone sitting upon the battered footstool, was dressed in her nightgown and wrapped up in a red shawl. It was Ermengarde. Ermengarde, cried Sarah. She was so startled that she was almost frightened. You will get in trouble. Ermengarde stumbled out from her footstool. She, she shuffled across the attic into in her bedroom slippers, which were too large for her. Her eyes and nose were pink with crying. I, I know I shall if I'm found out, she said. But I don't care. I don't care one bit. Oh, Sarah, please tell me. What is the matter? Why don't you like me any more? Something in her voice made the familiar lump rise in Sarah's throat. It was so affectionate and simple, so like the old Ermengarde, who had asked to be best friends. It sounded as if she had not meant what she'd seemed to mean during these past few weeks. I do like you, Sarah answered. I thought, you see, everything is so different now. I thought you were different. Ermengarde opened her wet eyes wide. Why, it was you who were different, she cried. You didn't want to talk to me. I didn't know what to do. It was you who were different after I came back. Sarah thought for a moment. She saw she had made a mistake. I am different, she explained. Though not in the way you think. Miss Minchin does not want me to talk to the girls, and most of them do not want to talk to me. I thought, perhaps, you didn't, so I tried to keep out of your way. Oh, Sarah! Ermengarde almost wailed in her reproachful dismay, and then after one more work, look, they rushed into each other's arms. It must be confessed that Sarah's small black head lay for some minutes on the shoulder covered by the red shawl. When Ermengarde seemed to desert her, she had felt terribly lonely. Afterwards, they sat down upon the floor together, Sarah clasping her her knees with her arms, and Ermengarde rolled up in her shawl. Ermengarde looked at the odd, big-eyed little girl with an adoring look. I couldn't bear it any more, she said. I dare say you could live without me, Sarah, but I couldn't live without you. I was nearly dead. So tonight, when I was crying under the bedclothes, I thought all at once of creeping up here and just begging you to let us be friends again. You are nicer than I am, said Sarah. I was too proud to try and make friends. You see, now the trials have come, and they have shown me I am not a nice child. I was afraid they would, perhaps. Wrinkling her forehead wisely. That is what they were sent for. I don't see any good in them, said Ermengarde stoutly. Neither do I, to speak the truth. Uh, Sarah admitted frankly. But I suppose there might be good in things, even if we don't see it. There might doubtfully be good in Miss Minchin. Ermengarde looked around the attic and with a rather fearsome curiosity. Sarah, she said, do you think you can bear living here? Sarah looked around also. If I pretend it's quite different, I can, she answered. Or if I pretend it's a place in a story. She spoke slowly. Her imagination was beginning to work for her. It had not worked at all for her since her troubles had come upon her. She felt as if she had been stunned. Other people have lived in worse places. Think of the Count of Mont... Monte Cristo. Monte Cristo in the dungeons of the Chateau de Faux. And think of the people in the Bastille. The Bastille? Half whispered Ermengarde, watching her and beginning to be fascinated. She remembered stories of the French Revolution which Sarah had been able to fix in her mind by her more dramatic relation of them. No one but Sarah could have done it. A well-known glow came into Sarah's eyes. Yes, she said, hugging her knees. That will be a good place to pretend about. I'm a prisoner in the Bastille, and I have been here for years and years and years and years, and everyone has forgotten about me. Miss Minchin is the jailer, and Becky... A sudden light adding itself to the glow in her eyes... Becky is the prisoner in the next cell. She turned to Ermgard, looking quite like the old Sarah. I shall pretend that, she said, and it will be a great comfort. Ermgard was at once enraptured and awed. Will you tell me about it, she said. May I creep up here at night, whenever it is safe, and hear the things you have made up in the day? It will seem as if we were more best friends than ever. Yes, answered Sarah, nodding. Adversary tries people, and mine has tried you and proved how nice you are. 
And that is the end of our chapter. Uh, we shall leave you. Stay safe, be awesome, and keep reading. Thank you for listening. Bye for now.